seen what you can do. Oh, God of wonder, your power has no end. The things you've done before, the things you've done before, in greater measure, you will do again. Because there's no reason why you can't break through. And you can move oh, things impossible. Yeah, there's no broken body you can raise, oh, so that you can say.
of this collection and believing this is not just a statement that we're throwing out there, but this is a message we're giving to the people of God, that it is not over no matter where you are going, no matter what you've gone through, where you are, that God is continuing to beckon you and to bring you to where he is. And until we get to glory with our eternal bodies and our good, our goodness, and we're in the presence of God, which is totally pure and un, and un tainted by the wickedness of this world, then we'll keep saying it's not over. Rain or shine, it's not over. And we'll keep believing that any moment Christ will return, any moment our breakthrough will come to pass, any moment Mallory will stand up and walk, maybe during this sermon she'll stand up and we'll celebrate with her. I want to talk tonight about the relationship between pressure and purpose. The relationship status that they have on social media is it's complicated. Between pressure and purpose, meaning this, that every single person that is alive, breathing in this room, has purpose on their life. You believe that? That God has given you purpose on this earth. That your purpose may look different than my purpose, but our purpose is the same. It is to be like Christ and to help others be like Christ. You can package that in whatever package you want. Photography or painting or sports or machinery or whatever it is. My favorite, underwater basket weaving. I don't care what you want to make it. You're under those water, waters weaving those baskets, then you profess Jesus as Lord. I don't care to the fish if you got to. But then pressure though. Pressure comes against our purpose. Oftentimes it shows us how great our purpose is. Oftentimes the greater the pressure, the greater the purpose. This is why things that are really good are really hard. This is why it's difficult to have a really great marriage. This is why it's difficult to be a person of character. This is why it's difficult to want to pursue after Jesus. This is why it's difficult when other people are doing the easy thing. It's difficult to do the hard thing that is right. Because the pressure that comes against purpose. But it's not that God doesn't know about the pressure and purpose relationship. He created it because through the pressure comes greater purpose. So I want to talk to you on the title today, The Gift of Grit. The Gift of Grit. Grit is described as, you know the definition, anybody? Grit. That resilience is good. That's right, tenacity. Grit is described as working hard for long periods of time in the midst of many obstacles. Grit is not a walk in the park. It's also not a punishment. It's a gift. I'm not talking about willpower or can you just withstand something. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a gift. The power of the Holy Spirit being made inside of you built inside of you to withstand all kinds of pressure outside of you so that purpose can happen and give God glory. That's what I'm talking about. Grit. The gift of grit. See, what many of us thought is that we were being punished, but actually what was happening, happening was we're being prepared. What you've been looking at through the lens of punishment is actually preparation for the purpose that God wants to take you into. But because you've been thinking over and over again, this is just beating me down. This is just pushing me down. This is just hurting my back. This is just keeping me from doing what I need to do. This has actually been preparing you for the level that God has taken you. And so I look at it and I say, however difficult you seem, however hard this is, however much pressure this is, I just know one thing. The purpose must be really big because if this kind of pressure is coming against my life right now I mean who am I that pressure would come against me there must be purpose inside of me guess what there's purpose inside of you that is longing to come out that's why grit is a gift and how we steward this gift of grit really matters it could have great impact or we could flush it totally down the toilet. 
because some of us in this room were made to withstand what other people cannot fathom. What broke other people down ends up building us up to be stronger than we ever thought we could be. I want to bring you into a story in, in the scriptures. If you want to turn to Genesis, turn to Genesis chapter 37. That's where the story starts. It starts in 37, takes a little break in 38, kind of. A little weird Tamar story that's in there. And then jumps back into 39, goes a few chapters. Just Genesis 37, the story of Joseph. It's a very interesting story, and I think one that really symbolizes the gift of grit that was built up inside of him. Again, I'm not talking about can you withstand our willpower. I'm talking about something that the Holy Spirit deposits inside of you. It's this holiness that's inside of you. It's the spirit of the living God that's being crafted, not just a small dose, but being built up through all the things that are happening and have happened in your life. So here's Joseph. And his brothers don't like him. He's the youngest of many brothers. His brothers don't like him because he gave a bad report on his brothers. I'm going to give you a little Joseph history lesson today as we go through and read some of this text and learn about the gift of grit. All right, you ready? I don't know why you're not taking notes, but that's fine. The gift of grit, write it down. Joseph, 37. If you know, you know. So his brothers don't like him because he's too honest. His dad asked how your brother's doing, and he said they're lazy. So they, they got jealous of him and didn't like him. On top of that, his dad, because he was the youngest, made him a coat of many colors. He wore that whole Joseph in the coat of many colors. You maybe saw the play or something. Who knows? Um, but the play is not the biblical, you know, but you guys the coat in it at least. And so he's, he has the coat, and his brothers get extra jealous because of the coat, and, and this kind of this family thing is going on. And then on top of that, Joseph is a dreamer, and so he starts getting all these dreams. Anybody in here dream powerful dreams? Yeah. He starts getting all these dreams, and, and the interpretation of the dreams basically involve great purpose in Joseph's life because the dreams are for him. Probably God was trying to speak to everyone in their dreams. They just weren't listening. But Joseph was getting these dreams. He was interpreting them, and they were basically saying that his brothers were going to bow down to him because he was going to be really great. And even his dad kind of didn't like that. Everyone got pretty confused. And so eventually what happened is his brothers get him out in the field one day alone, and they say, you know what, let's get rid of this guy. Let's throw him into a pit. Let's leave him there. One out of the other brothers, Reuben, made a sandwich after him because of his almost integrity that he had, didn't want to throw Joseph in the pit, it says, but he still let the, others, the other brothers do it. And Reuben was thinking, I'll go back after the other brothers leave and I'll pull him up out of the pit. Didn't work out quite like that. Joseph gets thrown into a pit. You ever been in a pit before? You have. It just maybe wasn't a hole in the ground. I want to I wanna preach about your grit from the pit for a second because I think it matters. Your grit in the pit begins to show what you have because the moment Joseph got thrown into the pit would have been a really great time to give up. My brothers don't like me. They stole my coat. My father's confused about me. God's giving me dreams. They're not coming true. I don't know what to do. Some people would have just got a rock, bashed themselves in the head, found a rope, done whatever. Like, just, just kill yourself. You're in the pit. You're never going to get out. But here's the thing. The, the, the grit that was being built inside of Joseph, through the years of ridicule that his brothers gave him, gave him something in the pit that other people wouldn't have had. The years of, of ridicule or feeling uncomfortable gave you a boldness and a security in who God made you to be. The years of not feeling accepted lets you know how important it is to be accepted by the Father. I was talking with Zach today at lunch at his favorite place because he's only been to like six places since his accident. Spring Creek Barbecue. On Sunday they got free ice cream. That's why we were there. But he ate too many rolls to have ice cream. The lady came by again and said, you want some more hot bread? I'm like, no, nah, if I eat hot bread, I'm about to pass out. And he was like, I'll have some more. And she gave him some more. He goes, I'm going to take it for the road. <laughs> I thought, okay. By the time she walked away, he ate it. <laughs> I said, I thought she was going to take it for the road. <laughs> uh, it's too good. It's too hot. Too fresh. I'm telling on you, aren't I, Zach? 
he was there, and I was asking him, we were talking, as we always do, and he was just talking about how he'll never take for granted again moving his pinky finger. He'll never take for granted again running. He dreams. In his dreams, his body's fully well. He doesn't dream. He doesn't dream crippled. He doesn't dream on a walker. He dreams on a motorcycle. I said, that's the way to dream right there. That's how I dream too. In my dream, my hair is down. It's flowing too. What you going to do about that? I want to talk about your, your grit that you have when you're at your lowest of lows. When you've been tossed by the people that should have liked you and should have been your family and should have been on your side down into a pit. The worst part is, then they come back and they think, oh man, no, you know what, hop back up, man, come on up, come on up. And Joseph is so excited, I'm reading into the text here, I'm just putting on to Joseph's emotions. I can imagine as his brothers are pulling him out of the pit, he's thinking, oh man, I'm so glad I didn't have to stand here much longer than that, this is so great. And Reuben's just, you know, like, probably extra relieved. Actually, he had run off, so Reuben didn't know. Reuben thinks he's still in the pit, and so... He gets pulled up out of the pit, and he's like, oh, man, I knew you guys loved me. I'm so glad. And they're like, no, no, we didn't love you. We just thought, why would we waste your life down in a hole? We're going to sell you as a slave. So just when he thought it was over, he was getting pulled up out of the hole. From the hole, he's going over to slavery. They sold him. They thought, well, we might as well make some money on him. Then they take his coat, throw him into that. He gets sold into slavery. But we know the story of Joseph, those that have read it, and we know that really great stuff is coming. The problem is, when you're in the middle of the story on chapter 4 of a 20-chapter life, and you've made it from, you got born, past junior high, you survived that. That's grit from the pit right there. You've been reborn. You've got a job and you realize it wasn't as great as you thought. Don't care what job it was, you realize that. Then you got money and you realize it wasn't as much as you needed. And you're on chapter four and you're thinking, surely it's got to be better than this. And God knows that if you hadn't been through that, then you wouldn't be prepared for this. And if there was something inside of you that He's been creating, Something inside of the Holy Spirit's been brewing up. That's been creating this determination that's not just bound by the flesh, but is fueled by the Spirit. That whether you're in a hole or whether you're sold to some people you don't know, whether your brothers or sisters turn their back on you or whether you're isolated, it doesn't matter. That there's purpose being created. We want... The end goal, we want the purpose. We don't want to go through any pressure. We say, God, bring me, the, bring me the picture that I have in my mind. You're praying for the end result. Michael, why don't you bring me this, the, the, uh, Either one. Why don't you bring me the Mustang? Look at this. It's 39 miles to the gallon. Even the trunk opens. It's got a little NOS can in there. <laughs> um, too fast. Too furious. Okay, nobody? All right, just me. Look at that. Look at all the detail in this thing. You're, you're praying for the Ford Mustang, and you know what it looks like and what color it is and how it works. You're praying for the marriage. You're praying to be the leader that God put in your heart. You got the picture of the business you want to start. You got the picture of the relationship you want to be in. And it looks like this. It looks really great, you know, besides the fact it's just a little miniature guy. But, you know, if you were small, you fit in there. That's awesome. Let me shrink you down. Toss you in there. And you've been praying, and this is what you've been picturing. And God has been just lining it up in your spirit over and over again. And then, when God finally brings it to you, it doesn't look like this. 
It looks like this. And you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. God, I wanted a race car, not a lawnmower. And he's like, you got to start somewhere. This age five and up. You can do this. God, I don't want to mow grass. I don't want vegetables. I want to go fast, God. Show me the picture of, of, what I, of what I had. Joseph is saying, show me the picture of the nations bowing down to me. Show me the picture of me being the provider through your strength, God. Show me, the, show me the grit that you're making inside of me. Show me what it looks like. Show me the future spouse. Show me the future job. Show me the future house. God, show me the character that you're building. Show me the fruit I'm going to have. Show me, show me, show me. When he brings it, we decline it. Because we know, we know what we want. We want the Mustang. Well, the Mustang shows up. It's in a box. That's all right. I don't mind taking stuff out of a box. All my Amazon stuff comes in a box. We open the box. There's no car in here. God, this is parts. I don't want parts. I wanted the end result. I look at the box. Expert mode. My God, you're the expert. You build it. Send it down here already done. He says, no, we build it together. You want the, grit? You want the gift of grit? We make it together. You want to see purpose in your life? Then handle the pressure that's on you. But you open it up. You pull out one piece and you try to measure it to the car and you don't see greatness. You see disappointment. And so we start getting frustrated with God. God, what's going on? And here's, and here's Joseph in his life. And he went from a pit to being sold into slavery. And now he went from being the guy who had the cool coat at the house to the guy who has no coat being drugged behind some camels to some random place. What about the dreams, God? He said, this is part of the dream. And this is part of the dream. And this is part of the dream. But we get about 20 pieces in and we're like, we don't want the dream anymore. Bring the Mustang back. I'll take the lawnmower. We want to give up on it. No, am I the only person? Am I the only person that's going through something hard? Am I the only person who has, who has pressure on their life? Am I the only person who's reading the story of Joseph and has seen myself in it? Am I the only person who's thinking, God, if you wanted me to go through this, you better show up and make it. And he's saying, we, we are making it. This is the picture that you wanted. This is the prayer that you prayed for. This is the dream that you wanted. You wanted awesome. I gave you awesome. Don't think it will be awesome and be easy. If it was easy, it'd be simple. But if it's awesome, it will be complex. Good news, I'm the alpha. And I am the omega. And I am everything in between that. I am the provider. I am all knowing. I am all powerful. I am inside of you building right now this gift of grit that will withstand whatever the accuser wants to bring into your life. Whatever your family tries to challenge you with. Whatever your spouse tries to challenge you with. Whatever your job tries to challenge you with. Whether it's intentional or unintentional. I will prepare inside of you a force through the power of the Holy Spirit that is so strong to withstand whatever happens. So when you open up package six out of 12 and you put it together and you say, this is not the picture, just remember, it's not the picture. It's part of the picture. It's part of what's happening. So Joseph goes, pardon me. <laughs> That's Spring Creek, hey. So Joseph goes, it was the box, guys. So Joseph goes from hole in the ground to sold to when it gets to the palace, all of a sudden, they start realizing the purpose that's on him. And so all of a sudden, 
In Genesis chapter 39, verses 2 and 3, we see the Lord was with Joseph. Of course he was. And he became a successful man. And he was in the house of his Egyptian master. And his master saw that the, that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all he do to succeed. Everything his hands touched began to succeed. And an unsaved person noticed a saved person and noticed the God that was on them and what that God would do through them. He made everybody rich. He made everybody look good. But the problem was that his boss's wife wanted him. But he had too much integrity to lay with her. You ever had too much integrity to do the wrong thing? You did the right thing and it still turned out the wrong way? I have. So she waited till the, till the time when no one else was around to throw herself on him so much so that the, she grabbed his robe and she pulled it off. And he ran out half naked, not naked, naked, <laughs> to cover it up. He ran out half naked, and she screamed and lied on him that he threw himself on her, but that she wouldn't do it. People be telling lies. So what happens to him, he goes from pit in the ground, to sold to slavery, to on top, half the car is built, he's doing great, Lego pieces are flying together, somebody walks by and kicks the whole thing over, he goes straight to jail. It's not Monopoly. For real, he goes straight to jail. That's when, if you didn't quit in the hole, if you didn't quit as a slave, if you didn't quit when you were on top, if you didn't get too lazy when God was blessing you, then now, for sure, you would have quit. But here's the thing, Joseph Grit, don't quit. Because that's the kind of thing that God puts inside of you. To say, if you'll steward this gift correctly. If you'll steward this gift correctly, it will build something inside of you through the power of the Holy Ghost that will allow you to persevere against all obstacles. So there he's in jail. He's in jail for two years. While he's in jail, two other random guys he doesn't know come to jail and they have dreams. Joseph's like, boom, I know how to interpret dreams. God's given me a gift. So he tells them both what their dreams are and he tells them, but when you get out of here, don't forget about me talking about how I know dreams. Get me out of this prison. Guess what? They both forget. But grit don't quit. Anybody forgot about you before? I've been forgotten about. You ever pick, been picked last? I've been picked last. Every pickup game that I ever played that they never met me, they picked me last. Oh, shit. I don't want that guy. Pick him last. You ever been forgotten for real? Uninvited for real? Left out for real? I have. Two years in jail. I know some people that have been in jail. It's not fun. They didn't call me. Hey, it's a great time in here. Had, having a blast. No. How about being in jail for something you didn't do? What was Joseph saying to God then? What was God saying to Joseph then? But Joseph was remembering, if it's this kind of pressure, the purpose must be big. If I'm still alive, then so must the dream be that God put in my heart. I was wearing an Under Armour shirt the other day, a little golf polo. I bought it from a sporting goods store. Went in there, had a gift card, feeling really awesome. Bam, bought a, bought a shirt. This is a cool little shirt. I was wearing it, and someone was like, hey, man, that's a great shirt. I said, thanks. It touched it. It was like real soft. Thank you, Lord. Yes, amen. <laughs> I touched it. You know, they, they touched the shirt. It's like a real soft shirt. And then they were like, like, notice that it was an Under Armour shirt. And they were like, oh, man, it's Under Armour. And I was like, yeah. I don't wear a lot of Under Armour. I don't have a lot of Under Armour stuff, just coincidentally. And, and they were like, oh, man, it's like too good for my taste, you know. They were like, they were like I couldn't afford that. And I was like, bro, I, like, it's not like it costs $10,000. But in my head, I was like, oh, okay, cool. But what they didn't know is when they were saying that, I was thinking about Kevin Plank. You know who Kevin Plank is? He's the guy who invented Under Armour. So they were talking about they couldn't buy the shirt for $40 or whatever it costs, and that's fine. Like, their level of faith is none of my business. Um, 
But I was just thinking about I was just thinking about Kevin Plank. Because I know what Kevin Plank did to make the Under Armour shirts. Some of you do, some of you don't. I know that Kevin Plank was in his garage. He was totally broke. He had nothing left. He had taken his last credit cards that he had, and he had slid them for $40,000. He was $40,000 in debt, and you know what he had to show for it? One shirt. And nobody wanted to come see it, and finally one guy came and saw this $40,000 shirt. And guess what? He loved it. And he invested millions into it. And Kevin Plank, who you don't even know, made a shirt that I bought at the store that I wore that someone else complimented. And none of that has what spiritual value? And if Kevin Plank can be $40,000 in debt and make one shirt that somebody likes, what can you do one time with the power of the Holy Spirit inside of you? I don't know if Kevin Plank saved. If he was saved, I'd probably know it. I don't, I don't think that he is. Maybe after this, he'll watch it, he'll get saved. I don't know. Imagine what, where are you at, Kevin Plank? Imagine what God would do through you if you were saved. But imagine what he would do through you right now if you said, all right, I'll take it all. I'll put it on the line for Jesus. Because I believe this, that purpose inside is inside of me. And everything I've been walking through, in debt, out of debt, one shirt, no shirt, I have been walking through for the glory of Jesus. Because guess what? One day, the leader of the world, Pharaoh, he got dreams he couldn't interpret. So what did he do? He called Joseph, the dream interpreter. He said, Joseph, you can interpret these dreams. And he said, I can't, but God can. Next time it gets hard. Next time you're looking at your one piece that doesn't even make sense. What is this, God? What does this piece do? Remember, you can't, but God can. Remember, there's a gift being built inside of you. There's a gift being crafted inside of you. He called Joseph. Joseph. Joseph interpreted the dream. Not only did Joseph interpret the dream, but he gave an incredible plan for what was going to happen. The dream involved that there was going to be many years of famine on the earth. Joseph knew it. He called it in advance because God spoke to him. But not only that, then he said, here's what we're going to do to make sure we don't suffer during this time. The ruler, Pharaoh, loved the plan. And so what did he do? He took him, the guy who went from a pit in the ground to a slave to on top, from on top to in prison, comes out of prison. And guess what? He says, you can have it all. He gives him it all. He says right here, in Genesis chapter 41, 40, he puts him over everything. He gives him the robe. He gives him the ring. He gives him the authority. He says, the only person that has that has greater authority than you is me because I'm the king and the only difference, difference between me and you is I'm the king. You can do anything you want. Everyone listens to you. Whatever you say, everybody does it. The guy's, the guy's like three hours out of prison. They had, they, they had to clean him off. He's been in jail for two years. There's no electricity down there. And now he's about to help everyone not ran out of food for several years. Now he's about to save everyone's life because he had foresight nobody had. Now, because he was picked on when he was a kid, he can withstand the pressure as an adult to say, no, no, it's not me, it's God. He gets married, he has kids, the Lord's healed his heart. Now his brothers come from, an unknown, from, a, from, a, from the land far away. They come, and guess what they do? They bow down, and they ask for food, and then he sees it. Here's the dream. But how does it happen if he doesn't go to prison? But how does it happen if he doesn't get thrown in a hole? But how does it happen if there's no slavery? How does it happen if people don't lie about him? How does it happen if his brothers don't hate him? How does it happen if his coat gets taken away? He went from farmer to world leader. He went from having one coat to owning the factory that makes every single coat that every person wears. He went from eating some food out in the field to owning every single harvest that happened. It said they put so much in storage. He stored so much food for the time of famine that they stopped counting it. Why? Because he allowed God to take him through whatever God needed to take him through, that God would get glory, that his people would be worshipped, but that he would be worshipped by his people. 
But many of us would have been like, okay, we're done. The pit, we're over. Okay, jail, we're done. Okay, slavery, we're done. They lied about me, I'll lie about them. Yeah? How's that working out for you? Don't even know what this piece does. But the creator does. I don't know what piece God's working on you right now. I don't know what gift of part of the gift of grit he's trying to put inside of you. He's trying to build inside of you. He's trying to craft inside of you so that when the pressure comes, you can withstand. But here's what I know. It has purpose. So just stand up. I'm going to ask the band to come up. I'm going to attend a response. Also, we're going to celebrate new life and baptism here in just a minute. But I want to take a moment. I want to pray for you. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him, talking about God, you're not the him in that. Neither am I. Now to the God who can do exceedingly, uh, abundantly more than you and I have ever thought or dreamed or imagined. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. How many have a dream of something more that could happen in their life? How many have a purpose inside of them that they're just that they just know God can be drawn out? Here's what I here's what I see. When I look in the room, I see all the purpose. And sometimes I see all the pressure too. Would you close your eyes, bow your head for a second? Father, I lift up every person in this room who you've been pulling at their heart, letting them know that there's purpose inside of them that's greater than they could ever know. Letting them know. That it's not for nothing. That it's never been for nothing. That it's for your glory. And that just because you're the God who can, it's for our good. So change our perspective this week. Change our lenses this week. We believe in miracles. But even until the miracle comes, we believe that you're growing something inside of us that has great purpose. Thank you, God, for the gift of grit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, we're going to celebrate new life in baptism. I got Hayden right here. If you're a friend of Hayden and you want to come around him and celebrate him, we'd love for you to do that. This is your first time celebrating baptism. Here's what's gonna happen. We're gonna dunk him under the water. We're gonna bring him up, but not just for fun. What's happening is on the outside, we're symbolizing what's already taking place in Hayden on the inside. You know that grit, that gift of grit we were talking about? That comes from the power of the Holy Spirit because it lives inside of Hayden and every single person that declares Jesus is Lord. We're gonna dunk him down to symbolize the death of Jesus, but we're gonna bring him up in excitement to symbolize the new life in Jesus. Hayden, I see what God is doing in your life. I remember the time in this room when you stood up and you said, I'm giving, I'm giving my service to God. And since then, I've been seeing him transform you on the inside. And so I'm excited for the step of obedience you're taking on the outside. And I believe it is a key going into the doors, unlocking them for what you will walk through next. I believe the same thing, that the pressure that's been around you is just unlocking greater purpose to come out of you. That things that you've wrestled with before, you will breeze through now because obedience, obedience opens doors. Obedience brings closeness to the Father. Obedience grows our faith. There, you want to baptize it with me? I think it'd be pretty fun.
my authentic city family. I am so glad that you decided to join us for this powerful time of worship. I hope that it impacted you as much as it impacted me. And guess what? There are so many ways for you to stay connected with us throughout the entire week. So make sure that you're following our social media. Make sure that you have our app. There's so much life-giving content and so much to go out right there. So make sure that you're connecting with us in those places. Hey, one portion or one part of our worship to God is our obedience. And you know what God tells us to do? He tells us to give. And so, so, so maybe today is the first day that you decide to step into that new obedience. I'm knowing that God is going to bless you for that. If you'd like to give, there's a couple of ways you can give. You can give on Venmo or you can go to authentic.church and give under the give tab. Hey, we love you guys and we'll see you next Sunday.